Good morning. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this um, breakfast meeting, or Asakai, here at the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. Um, my name is Anthony Rowley. I'm a former president of the club, and uh, it's my uh, pleasure today to uh, act as moderator and to welcome, introduce our guest, Mr. Paul Sheard, to my right, obviously, who's, I think it's no exaggeration to say he's an economist of international repute. Um, and currently, he's an, an M hyphen RG, RC, BG, uh, senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And just in case there are any of you who don't know what M hyphen um, RCBG stands for, it stands for the Mosavar Rahmani Center for Business and Government. So that's that explained. Um, Paul is a very well-known face and a very well-known voice in this club. He's spoken here many times before. Um, and we've shared that privilege with, of hosting him with many eminent institutions in various parts of the world, including New York, Washington, et cetera, et cetera. Today, he's going to talk about key issues facing the global economy. Um, among other things, he'll discuss the current state of the US economy and the outlook for Federal Reserve policy, the implications of Brexit, and the future of the EU as the UK general election is coming up. And of course, he'll be looking to at Japan's economic outlook. Let me just say briefly that among the professional incarnations that uh, Paul has had have been those of global chief economist at Standard & Poor's in New York, and chief economist at Lehman Brothers and at Nomura Securities in Tokyo and in New York. So if you um, would put your Keitai Denbo onto Manamo, please, let me um, ask you to join me in welcoming Mr. Paul Sheard. <coughs> Thank you very much, Anthony, That's, uh, for that very warm uh, introduction. And uh, let me say what a great pleasure and honor it is to be uh, back at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan, a very august institution, uh, but particularly uh, thrilled to be here at the new location, which is uh, quite uh, magnificent. So um, let me dive straight in and talk about uh, some of the key issues for the global economy. And we'll leave plenty of time in the question and answer uh, section as well to raise uh, issues that uh, perhaps uh, you want to dig into in more depth or don't come up in this discussion. I mean, the biggest question, I guess, when one, one surveys the global outlook is the question, well, you know, where is it, where is it headed? Is the global economy going into recession? Um, nobody really can, uh, with any great authority, predict a recession. Um, they're pretty much unforecastable events. Uh, so, of course, I'm going to tell you it's pr probably not going into recession. You don't probably need to worry about that too much. Um, that's, I think, most people view. But the question's pertinent because the global economy has been slowing down over the last year or so. Um, I was just at the uh, IMF World Bank annual meetings in DC in December, oh, sorry, October, haven't got to December yet. Um, and the mood there was, you know, it was some quite cautious, um, I think the IMF described its global outlook as the global economy is looking a bit precarious. And they're pointing, of course, to the fact that there is a slowdown in the numbers. So if you look, for example, they have a thing called the World Economic Outlook look, which they update regularly, but the big one, I, I guess, is uh, sort of for the annual meetings. If you look at the forecast for this year, which kind of is half in the bag now, growth, uh, global growth is uh, forecast to be 3%. Uh, if you look a year prior, like one year prior, what was the IMF forecasting last year for this year? They were forecasting, um, I think it was 3.9%, um, if I've got my numbers correct. No, sorry, 37 3.7 percent, so 0.7 you know, 7 percentage points downgrade in a year. That's quite substantial for a, an, an economy, the super tanker kind of dimensions of the global economy. IMF is looking for growth to pick up uh, next year to about 3.4 percent, um, but they, there has been this progressive downgrading process going on. And the factors driving that, um, you know, the typical one that's mentioned, is the uh, trade, the trade tensions, the trade um, um, kind of trade war, if you like to call it, between US and, and Japan, obviously what's going on in Brexit, with Brexit and the EU. Uh, there's also been a bit of a, a slowdown relative to expectations for growth in India. And that's quite important because the way that the IMF sort of adds up GDP to get to a global number, 
is using not nominal exchange rates, but what's called purchasing power parity. Um, basically, how far does a dollar or rupee or a yen go in terms of buying goods and services in that economy? And on that metric, um, India is the third largest economy in the world. So, you know, does having a, a, a quite a substantial share now make a difference? So India's been a bit weaker as well. But the basic concern is of loss of momentum in the global economy uh, and particularly concerns around the retreat from globalization, which, if you like, has got those two dimensions I mentioned, uh, the, the trade tensions, particularly between the US and China, but not just there, of course. There's been, there are perhaps looming trade tensions uh, with the EU as well. Maybe they'll be the next cab to, to lose, uh, leave the rank. And then, of course, the whole Brexit EU uh, issue, which I'll get to in a moment. But, of course, to get a recession, I always you know, point out to people the, the obvious, that you need two things. You need the economy heading into recession, heading in that direction. And then you need policymakers to fail to notice that and take adequate measures to offset a, a, a slowdown turning into an outright recession. And we have seen central banks around the world in particular uh, cutting interest rates um, almost universally in order to buoy up a growth and also some fiscal support coming through as well. So big picture, global economy has probably hit a bit of a trough here, should pick up a little bit next year. But let me focus on uh, three kind of regions and, and topics as foreshadowed by Anthony. Uh, US, particularly US-China uh, trade tensions, uh, the EU and Brexit, and then say a little bit about Japan at the end. And then we can cover other topics in the, in the Q&A. So, um, just on, on the US, uh, you know, if I, I think I've talked at length in previous um, occasions, Anthony, on uh, the, the Trumponomics and what to make of Trumponomics. I won't go too far into that because it will be difficult to, uh, to get over to other topics. But um, I, I think when we look at this US-China trade war issue and everybody's wondering now what's going to happen in phase one of this process. Will there be a phase one agreement? Will some of those tariffs that have been put in place, which run into the you know, tariffs on hundreds of billions of, of imports to the US now, uh, will they be wound back? All of that's a little bit in, in abeyance. And you know, the president himself tends to frame this in terms of you know, cutting a deal, cutting a trade deal with China. What I've been pointing out for some time is that yeah, that's probably not the right way to think of this. I think that the, the big picture here is that we have a clash now of two sort of, sort of giant geopolitical and economic players, China and the US. And uh, I won't use Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations, but perhaps bordering on some kind of clash of systems. Um, and I mentioned you know, PPP before, um, purchasing power parity way of, of sort of comparing the size of different economies. On that metric, which is the standard metric that the you know, IMF, World Bank, OECD, everybody uses, China is actually the biggest economy in the world now. Uh, it's about 19% uh, of global GDP on a PP basis compared to the US of 14%. Now, a lot of people poo-poo that because it sort of it's, feels like you've sort of massaged the data. If you do look at just the raw size using nominal exchange rates and comparing, the US is still the largest economy in the world. It's about 24% of nominal GDP. China's about 16% of nominal GDP. But China's growing about three times the rate of the US. It's per capita GDP, again, depending on how you measure it, Nominal is, let's call it 10,000. PPP is more like 16,000, 16, 17,000. The US is more like 60,000 on both of those metrics. So the, China's growing at three times the rate of the US at the moment, and it's got enormous economic development potential. I mean, its economic development and rising living standards could go on literally for decades. And of course, if it does, China ends up being the dominant economy in the world. So I think we've you know, the bigger context here for, for thinking about the, 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 the um, arrival of uh, President Trump on the scene, uh, all of the trade war talk, America first, make America great again, is really in this context of the sort of the realization or the penny dropping that the US can no longer, is no longer the sole uh, you might call benign hegemon in the world. Um, some people dispute the benign part, but you know the, 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 the country that has been underwriting the liberal international order 
being the sort of the underwriter of global security, and also being the consumer of first and last resort, having very open markets. And President Trump has come along and sort of looked at the situation and says, China is eating our lunch. Why are we not demanding reciprocity? Why are we not demanding of our allies, Japan included, that they pick up more of the weight of defense, burden sharing, etc. So, um, you know, I think while pr a lot of the President Trump's rhetoric is sort of dismissed, and if you're in the US like I am, it's, you know, you're, it's a hyper-partisan uh, atmosphere. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's important to have that context, that there is a, a, a really important geopolitical, geoeconomic shift which has taken place and will continue to take place. And the world is now having to sort of figure out how to adjust to this new reality. And particularly when, you know, China has a different economic and political system from the, the, the typical um, Western economy, um, particularly when it comes to the political system and, if you like, the rule of law. So I think those, those issues are coming to the forefront. So what's it got to do with the US economy? As an economist, what... Um, and again, I've, I've quoted some of these numbers at previous presentations here. But every quarter, we get the quarterly GDP report. And I find it, it's, very, it's very useful to look at that report because you can, it's a scorecard on how the Trump administration is going or how the US economy is going uh, under the stewardship of, of the Trump administration. Um, and we now have 11 quarters of GDP. And what you can do is look at both what average GDP growth has been like and also what's driving growth. And what's been very interesting tracking those numbers is, for the f until quite recently, there has been um, a significant gap uh, in favor of the Trump economy versus, if you like, the Obama economy. So when I do this calculation, I look at if there's 11 quarters under Trump, I go back and look at the 11 quarters, the prior 11 quarters under President Obama, a sort of a like-for-like -like comparison. And up until about two quarters ago, when you did that calculation, it was pretty stark. There was about a 0.9 percentage point difference between the average growth rate. So growth was much, you know, significantly faster under uh, President Trump's stewardship than it was under President Obama. Now, that's a little bit surprising because there's much less slack in the economy now, in the labor market. Unemployment rate is down to about 3.6% in the US, nobody thought it would ever get down to that level again. So there's less e sort of economic slack, labor market slack to eat into. That makes it harder to grow at a faster rate. But nonetheless, up until a couple of quarters ago, that's been the case. Um, the previous quarter, uh, I saw that gap narrow from about 0.9 percentage points in the Trump economy favor down to 0.3%. And then we recently got the third quarter GDP uh, number and Interestingly enough, it's now a, a, a dead heat. So 11 quarters under President Trump, average quarter on quarter, seasonally adjusted rate, annualized rate is 2.6%. And that just happens to be the average growth rate under the prior 11 quarters of, of Obama. Um, interesting. Now, if you look at the contributions, so what, what's sort of interesting again from a, putting the politics against the economics here is, the rhetoric that comes out of the Trump administration um, is, is very gung-ho on the economy and very sort of boastful of how well it's done and how badly it was doing under President Obama. And that's a sort of a political narrative on the Republican side in the US. But the, the numbers are actually testing that and making it a little bit hard to sustain. It will be interesting to look as we go through election year next year, as these quarterly numbers come in, what that picture looks like. Um, and, uh, and, and, and see what numbers, the, what story the numbers tell. <clears throat> now, you can, when you get these GDP reports, you can look at the breakdown, what's driving growth. And again, there's been a pretty consistent story, which has been that what was driving that higher growth uh, in the Trump era was consistently uh, business investment, cap capex, and net exports being less of a drag. It's a bit of a mouthful, it's a bit convoluted. Net exports in the US typically are a drag um, with the expanding uh, budget, uh, sorry, trade deficit. But under the Trump 
it's been less of a drag than it was under Obama, and that gives you higher growth. But CapEx was the key driver, which sort of fits the narrative of President Trump having unleashed sort of animal spirits with a lot of deregulation, with the corporate tax cuts, with a whole sort of um, atmospheric change of, of saying, you know, America's back. It's time for manufacturing to come back to the US and for the economy to boom again. Again, that those drivers have also dissipated. Um, and there's still a bit of a, an effect, um, but much less so. And particularly on the net exports side, um, if you look at the last six quarters, which is basically since, um, or maybe five quarters, five or six quarters since the trade wars with China started, um, there's been a clear effect you can see in the GDP statistics, particularly on the export side, more so than the import side, um, of uh, net exports not contributing to the economy in the way that they were in the earlier period. Another statistic that, um, and I do believe actually, although I have no basis for this, that the president himself, when he talks and quotes numbers, does believe the numbers. You know, he's not like me. He's not sitting in front of a computer digging through GDP numbers. He's hearing from his advisors and whatnot. Um, and he does, I think, genuinely believe what he says. But you will f uh, very frequently hear, particularly in campaign speeches or interviews, the remarkable jobs growth, how many jobs have been created under President Trump. Now, that's, this is probably the most close, closely watched monthly uh, or economic uh, data point in the US, payrolls, monthly payrolls. Um, if you look at average monthly payrolls, we now have about 33 months of data under President Trump has been running about 189,000 per month. So each net terms, people in employment being added at the rate of 189,000 per month, which is good. That's a strong number for the US economy, no doubt about it. But if you go back and look at what, what was the average growth rate of jobs, payrolls under uh, President Obama in the same period, prior period, that's about 224,000. So ironically enough, despite, despite this rhetoric, jobs growth was stronger. Now again, that kind of makes sense to an economist because under that period, unemployment rate was higher and there was more labor market slack to eat into. So it was easier to generate jobs growth with the right policies. And of course, it's mainly the Federal Reserve that's responsible for those policies. But it just is not true that jobs growth has been stronger uh, in the Trump administration. Now, what is true is that manufacturing jobs growth has been stronger. But manufacturing jobs are only a relatively small, about 8.5% of the US workforce. Um, and if you look at those numbers, again, 33 months like for like comparison, under uh, President Trump so far, it's been averaging about 13,000 per month. Under President uh, Obama, it was about 7,000. So manufacturing jobs growth has been about double under President Trump than it was under uh, President Obama, which is sort of consistent with this story of some manufacturing jobs coming back to the US. But two points. The magnitudes are very small. You just n cannot get much leverage out of the manufacturing sector in terms of jobs growth because it's very automated, very capital intensive, um, and um, you know, the, just not able to generate jobs growth in, in, as, as you see in the service sector. But the second point I'd like to make is, looking at this data, um, it struck me that in the last eight months, now there's nothing magical about the last eight months, it just, if you look at the last eight months of data, net jobs growth in the manufacturing sector in the US has been slightly negative. I mean, it's a rounding error. Round it to zero, but it's about 800 and, sorry, 686 jobs. It's that's, you know, we get down to such small magnitudes here. The prior 25 months, there's 33 months of labor market data. The last eight months, it's basically been flat to slightly negative. The prior 25 months, manufacturing jobs growth was running at about 17,500 per month. So again, for the, for the manufacturing sector, 17,500 per month was a really good result and a really good story, particularly from a political point of view, because bear in mind, it was only about 40,000 votes if 40,000 votes in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan had swung the other way in 2016, Hillary Clinton would be in the White House today. So these numbers, you know, translated these economic numbers into political 
language um, actually are much bigger potentially. So, but it, but but nonetheless, if I was, I guess, an advisor to the president, um, I would be saying, um, you know, this China strategy, getting back to China, is 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 all fair and well, and maybe you want to spend some political and economic capital on this, and maybe you need to do it, but just be, bear in mind that we are seeing in the data now some signs of this, these trade wars impacting the, uh, the US economy. So it'll be very interesting next year, it'll be interesting to me at least, as the year unfolds, and we're gonna be in this frenetic political environment, whether um, th how these numbers run, and if they keep running the way they're running at the moment, whether the, the president does tack towards maybe you know, sort of a short-term rapprochement with China. Um, but if, if he does, uh, you know, again, I would just make the point that the China issue is not going away because it is really much more structural and systemic than something that can be dealt with in a, uh, in a very simple trade deal. Um, just on the Fed, I won't, uh, watching the clock here, so I'll, I won't say very much, but I, I mentioned that central banks have been cutting, and guess what? The Fed has cut 75 basis points uh, in the last uh, <coughs> half a year, less than half a year. It does now appear to be on hold. So last year, 2018, the Fed saw an economy that was you know, looking pretty robust, that uh, second year of the Trump administration. Unemployment kept coming down. Inflation was you know, pretty close to target. And they thought, fair enough, now's the time to start to take back the interest rate cuts. They got the federal funds rate up to two and a quarter to two and a half percent. Now, they would like you know, from a comfort point of view, for that federal funds rate to be more like 3.5%, um, even a little bit more. They kind of got within 100 basis points of where they would have liked to have been, but lo and behold, the economy started to weaken. They did get pressure from the president, but I think most economists would agree the Fed makes these decisions, you know, very much based on what they see. Their job is to maintain full employment, try to get to 2% inflation, just like the Bank of Japan, just like most central banks, and if they see the situation slipping, they take action. So they've now, in pretty rapid uh, uh, succession, uh, taken, you know, sort of reversed three quarters of the, of the tightening that took place last year. But they're on hold now, they think that you know, they've done enough for the time being, but they'll see how the data flows. But the other interesting thing that's happened at the Fed, um, which is, is almost more interesting from a Japan perspective, Japan, Bank of Japan having invented quantitative easing back in 2001, is that um, the, the Fed is now expanding its balance sheet again. So the, the normalization of monetary policy in the US was had two elements. One was to unwind the balance sheet, to shrink the balance sheet. Now the balance sheet back in uh, 2008, at the time of the financial crisis, was about $900 billion. And if the Fed's balance sheet, it's quite small, because there's not much cash in circulation uh, in, you know, in, the, in the US um, relative to GDP. If there had never been a, you know, credit easing and quantitative easing, the Fed's balance sheet would have probably now, because of the growth of the economy and the growth of the demand for cash, let's call it around about one and a half trillion dollars. That would have been the, the size of the balance sheet. The Fed's balance sheet got to four and a half trillion, almost four and a half trillion. And then a year and a half ago or so, they started to unwind it and it got down to 3.6, 3.7 kind of trillion. But then they sort of put it on hold and they said, we're gonna shift to operating monetary policy somewhat differently. We're not gonna, they didn't put it this way, but I'll put it in my terms. They didn't do what the Bank of Japan did in 2006 when it exited from quantitative easing, if you remember that in those days, because the Bank of Japan was not paying interest on reserves, it had to drain all the excess reserves from the system before it could raise interest rates. But it didn't take the Bank of Japan very, much, very long to do that because it hadn't expanded its balance sheet that much, only about 40% at the max. But the Fed had created trillions of dollars of excess reserves. So if the Fed had had to get rid of those excess reserves before raising interest rates, it would have been locked in for a number of years. But the Fed, uh, as most central banks now, pays interest on excess reserves. And that gives it an additional degree of freedom in terms of setting monetary policy. That is, it can start to raise the interest rate 
by raising the interest paid on reserves without having to worry about getting rid of the excess reserves in the banking system first. So that's actually pretty neat. But nonetheless, the Fed um, over the last you know, year or two sort of signaled to the markets that it, it was not going to bring the balance sheet down to a pre-crisis trend course. It was going to leave ample reserves in the banking system. But the surprise has been uh, really in around about September, um, a lot of volatility in the repo markets and the money markets, and it really forced the Fed's hand to start supplying more excess reserves to the system. So the Fed now is increasing um, or buying, uh, increasing its holdings of uh, Treasury debt at about 60 billion per month, and the balance sheet now is back to about four trillion dollars. So they're not calling it quantitative easing. It's there a little bit of a, a kind of a communications dilemma here. They're saying this is for liquidity provision, but um, again, as a, as a, as a central bank watcher, I think this is a very interesting thing that's happened here because there's something like $1.34 trillion of excess reserves in the, in the banking system on the Fed's balance sheet. So, you know, is it really the case that the Fed needs to supply more excess reserves to maintain liquidity in interbank markets? Um, I don't know, you know, it strikes me it shouldn't be. I don't quite understand why they need to do that. I'm not actually sure that they do understand it themselves. Um, but that's a that's a, a, an issue that we can we can come back to. Okay, so let me um, I run a little bit over time here, but let me get onto the EU uh, and and the Brexit issue. Um, you know, over the last year, if you wanted any entertainment, um, you didn't need to have Netflix or HBO or, or anything like that, or whatever the equivalent might be in, in Japan, um, Renzok Terebi drama or whatever, um, because all you needed to do was switch on the UK uh, Parliament and watch Question Time, etc., etc. This Brexit issue has been just an, an amazing um, uh, episode. Um, but. Let me just get back to where I started with the IMF numbers. Uh, if you look at the downgrades at the IMF, a year ago, the IMF was forecasting uh, Euro area GDP growth this year of 1.9%. That's now forecast to be 1.2%. And the UK, they were forecasting one5 and that is now one2 So I think you can say with some confidence that this whole Brexit kerfuffle um, what to call it, whatever you like, angst, has cast a pall over the European economy. And again, an economist would predict this, uncertainty about, you know, what's going to happen to um, the UK's place vis-a-vis -vis the EU, that is weighing on business investment in particular and holding back growth. Um, but the point that I've been making throughout this whole um, episode or Brexit EU um, developments over the last three years or so is that, I, I, to me, the Brexit issue is as much about the future of the EU as it is about the future of the UK and the UK disentangling itself from the EU. And the coverage of this, the commentary, the, the media focus, you know, has been like 99% focused on Britain and you know, everything that's going on there. And of course, it's a big thing for Britain. But it is, I would argue, just as big a thing, if not in some ways more significant, for the EU. Um, that's not just because the, e the UK is the second largest economy in the EU. And you know, I've pointed out that, well, it's technically the case that with the UK leaving the EU, uh, the EU, the number of member states will go from 28 to 27. In fact, in, in GDP terms, in the weight, GDP weight terms, it's as, as if the EU is going from 28 to 10. Because the UK GDP is as big as the smallest 18 member states of the EU. So this is a huge mm. loss for the EU in economic terms. It's, but you know, they're sort of putting a brave face on, on that. But my broader point is that the EU itself is very much as a, an entity. It's not a United States of Europe. It's not a collection of independent cooperating countries. It's something in between. It's a strange half-built sovereign house. And um, you know, it really needs to either 
move in the direction of further integration and completing the economic and monetary union and, and, and whatnot, and essentially move, transferring more and more sovereignty for various dimensions that still ex reside at the na nation state level to the European level, it either has to do that, or I believe that there will be overwhelming powers at work over a you know, sustained period, it may take years, that will be pulling the EU uh, apart, fragmenting it. And I think the Brexit is the first manifestation of that. But it's very ironic because the UK is not a member of the Eurozone, and that's probably the most problematic aspect, and neither is it a member of, of the Schengen, uh, the uh, you know, border-free uh, zone. Let me just give you a couple of numbers here. Um, if you look, a very simple metric is what, where is GDP relative to where it peaked out pre-financial crisis? That number for the US is 21%. So real GDP in the US is 21% above the peak uh, achieved back in, say, first quarter of 2008. <clears throat> for Japan, that number's pushing 7% now. All right. for, the e, for the euro area as a whole, the 19 countries that, are, that have the euro, it's about 9% um, above the pre-crisis. So if you think, you know, Japan's 7%, euro area is 9%, the US is 21%. But within the euro area, if you look at Germany, German, Germans, Germany's GDP is about 14% above pre-crisis. So it's not as good as the US, but it's, you know, it's pretty good economic performance. But Italy, which is the third largest member of the euro area, the level of GDP today is still almost 5% below the peak level it achieved prior to the financial crisis. And I would argue that that, to a large extent, is a product of the way that the eurozone operates, which is, as a monetary union, what that means for an economy like Italy is, it's, it, it's as if its exchange rate is pegged to the Deutschmark, so it cannot get any boost in competitiveness by depreciating its currency, and it has no direct control, or it doesn't have its own independent monetary policy. It has to accept the monetary policy that's set for the Eurozone as an average. Um, and it's, but it's, so it's that, it's a monetary union, but it's not a fiscal union. So it doesn't have the, fisc the ability to be part of an, an entity like a a province of Japan or a prefecture of Japan or a state in the US to benefit from coordinated fiscal expansion to try to boost the economic activity. Um, I'll give you another shocking statistic. The unemployment rate in Italy is still about 9.9%, but more to the point, it's about 4.1 percentage points above the pre-crisis trough. So just call it four percentage points above the low point below the, before the financial crisis. In Germany, on the other hand, German unemployment is 3.1%. And that number is almost four percentage points below the trough in Germany pre-crisis. So unemployment rate is 3.1 versus 9.9, .9, but the German unemployment rate is substantially below the low point be before the crisis, whereas Italy's unemployment rate is substantially above its pre-crisis low point. So from a German perspective, it's like, what are you guys complaining about? You know, they're doing very, very well. But I don't believe a situation like this is sustainable for the third largest economy in the euro area to be having this lost decade. Japan never, ever had a lost decade that looked anything like this. Net GDP uh, decline over a 10-year period. So th these economic problems, which I think are rooted in problems with the, f the institutional framework of the euro area, will seep through and are seeping through the political system. They haven't reached boiling point yet, but if they don't fix these problems um, you know, soon, and this will be the work of the new European Commission under Ursula von der Leyen, um, you know, it's going to be, I think, a, a race against, a, against time. So that's kind of what I mean by, um, by uh, this is really the focus in Europe has been so much on Brexit, whereas it should much, just as equally should, should be on what is the EU going to do about itself over the longer term. Now, I think there's a huge, has been a huge missed opportunity here, and I've been very critical of the EU on this score, which is they missed an opportunity both pre-referendum, but even post-referendum, 
to take a much more mature, strategic, statesmanlike approach to Brexit and try to kind of incorporate the Brexit debate and the Brexit issues in a much broader discussion of how to move Europe forward, including keeping the EU you know, in the fold, if not completely in the fold, very close to the fold. But instead of that, the approach has been very technocratic, very bureaucratic, I would say very defensive, and, 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 and I think quite antagonistic. And I don't think that is in either camp's uh, uh, favour to benefit. Um, very briefly, so where do things go from here? Most of what I just told you is kind of context and a little bit of history. Um, you know, there's been a major game changer, which is Boris Johnson coming in as, as Prime Minister, taking over from Theresa May, and of course having a very um, problematic minority government could not do anything in the Parliament, was losing votes in the Parliament left, right and centre, but now eventually has got to the point of having an election on December 12th, and you know, it does look like um, both from just the, the momentum that the Johnson government and the charisma that he brings to the table, which I think, you know, whether you like him or hate him, you can see this, he's got this magnetic kind of uh, element which plays well in elections. And with the polls, it, it looks very much like um, Conservative government will, cons the Tory party will get a majority, a working majority, and they'll be able to push ahead with uh, Brexit. I think the EU, that Britain would then leave the EU under this renegotiated withdrawal agreement on January 31st. And that will usher in the next phase, which is going to take at least through the end of 2020, but maybe even beyond, which is the so-called transition phase, where they now move on to discussion of you know, future relationship, trade deals, etc. I'm kind of hoping, I wouldn't put bet my house on this, but the fact that technically the UK will have, have left the EU on 1st of February next year, if that does happen, that will be a bit of a, a circuit breaker in terms of some of the dynamics that have been quite antagonistic. And the focus shifts much more to, okay, how do we make this a win-win situation rather than just dragging out this very uh, antagonistic uh, uh, episode much longer? Um, Two minutes on Japan, or would you? Fine. Three, okay, so three just minutes. Let, three minutes on Japan. <laughs> so this will be very quick. Um, famous last words. I'll watch the clock. <laughs> See if I can do this. So I'm actually quite, um, you know, positive on Japan from the the following viewpoint. Partly it's just when you come back to Japan, you just realise how wonderful the place is and everything works and the infrastructure. I'm like, yeah, I lived in Japan 17 years, but I'm still taking photos of, you know, how the, how clean the subways are and you know how the infrastructure, everything's everything's great not to mention the food. Um, so Japan has enormous assets, you know, caps, what I call social capital, um, you know, cultural assets, just the, the, the place just really works. But on a more macro scale, you, you know, Japan seems to have two major challenges. One is that the aging society, the fact that Japan is getting aged, is, you know, you know all this stuff. Aging society, very low fertility rate, and so over time, you know, a dependency ratio that, that starts to look worse and worse. So all the fears about the, you know, the, the sustainability of the society. But that's really a challenge around can Japan age and shrink its population and maintain its prosperity? Can it make the necessary internal adjustments some of which may involve, and already are involving, increased reliance on immigration to, re to relieve some of the, uh, the, the labour market uh, tightness, um, and, and do so in a way that you know, preserves the society and, and increases over time prosperity, and so doesn't run into a brick wall. Now that, that issue is normally framed in terms of the fiscal issues. Oh, this, Japan's going to run out of money, or we're going to have all this debt. You know, will my will I still get my pension? That's the way the economists like to frame the issue, but I think it's rather misleading. And I would I, th I would put that to one side, and I would think think about it more in terms of: Is Japan making the necessary? Does it have enough? You know, workers. Is it investing enough in technology, in AI? Is it adapting its social institutions, womenomics, and others, and maybe f figuring out ways to tap into the older, healthy workforce? I mean, in the U.S. now, how many? What do you call it? Septuagenarians. Mm. You know, people are running for president. You know, 77, 78. You know, you name it. I mean, 
we're living in a world now where people are living a lot longer, but they can also live much more vibrant, healthy, productive lives. So I'm much less concerned about the aging being this looming disaster than many. The second one is deflation. Now, again, the numbers here are sort of really striking. The GDP deflator, the overall measure of the sort of price level for the economy in, in Japan is still about 13, almost 13% below its peak level, and that was the second quarter of 1994. Um, benchmark that. Well, the US deflator in the same period is up 60%, more than 60%. So Japan's down 13%, same period the US is up 60%. What a GDP deflator, which is minus, means is that nominal GDP is less than real GDP. Normally, we have the opposite situation, where we're, whatever your real GDP is, your nominal GDP is more. And nominal GDP drives things like the stock market mm. and you know, house prices, and it's just, it, it just feels better to have nominal GDP growth higher than real GDP growth. So this deflation problem has been this chronic, systemic thing that took root in Japan in the mid-1990s, and it's, sort of, it's just been very difficult to expunge from the system. And there's reasons for that. Enter the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan under Governor Kuroda, April 2013, launches QQE, which has now gone through further incarnations to now being Q -Q 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 QQE with yield curve control. And in that period, the Bank of Japan's balance sheet has gone from uh, under Governor Shirakawa when he handed over about $164 trillion to now $576 trillion. And that number's probably out of date already because it's just increasing all the time. The JGB holdings, government debt holdings uh, of the Bank of Japan, has gone from 63 trillion to now 476 trillion. These are enormous numbers. The Bank of Japan now owns about half of JGBs in existence. Now, that scares a lot of people. It doesn't scare me one iota. Um, I take the opposite message, which is the following. Don't worry about the fiscal problems in Japan that everybody is always telling you to lose sleep over. Worry about the aging society, worrying about whether the society is going to be productive enough in the future. Social capital is maintained. But these numbers per se don't really matter because what, think about for a moment, what is quantitative easing? Quantitative easing, as I never tire of explaining, is a debt refinancing operation of the consolidated government, that is the government including the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan is part of the government, whereby the consolidated government via the central bank, by the bank via the Bank of Japan, retires government debt securities and refinances them into central bank money, central bank reserves. So take the extreme case where the Bank of Japan continues on this course and it has this overshoot commitment where it will continue to expand its balance sheet. But take the extreme argument. Let's say that the, in, in trying to overcome, def, to achieve 2% inflation, they bought up all of the JGBs in existence, which is what, 1,000 trillion, and they financed the entire flow of budget deficit. Then there would be no JGBs in existence. There would only be central bank reserves. Those central bank reserves cannot default. Therefore, the fiscal problems that people worry about will have essentially disappeared. So it seems to me that you should worry at a macro level in Japan about either a debt problem or a deflation problem, but it's sort of irrational or illogical to worry about both of them at the same time. Um, I would worry more about the deflation problem, but I think there's a way of, sol of solving that than I would about the fiscal problems per se. But let me just leave it there. Sorry I've gone over a little bit, but... Mm. Um, with your indulgence. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you very much. <coughs> you haven't gone on long as, as, as former Prime Minister Nakasone, whom I once moderated here, who spoke until one minute before he was due to finish his speech so as not to take any questions. OK, questions then from whoever. Uh, yes, there's a gentleman here. Um, please uh, t speak through the microphone and identify yourself, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angus McKinnon. I'm from a small, long-only investment fund called the LT Fund. Um, I'm curious. I have a lot of questions, so I'll try and limit to the most. Um, Sorry, li limited to two, if, two if I can. Um, first of all, I would like to understand more about the lag effects 
on the economy, uh, particularly in the US, first of all, because I think Obama inherited a, um, uh, an economy that is just coming out of the financial crisis, and then you had Bernanke and Yellen basically trying to pump that up. And um, so when Trump came in, he inherited the pumped up effect rather than um, what Obama had inherited, which was a, a destroyed um, economy. So um, I'd like to know more on your thoughts on lag effects for that. And second is also a lag effect. I've read, um, fortunately I can't quote where, but um, the trade war effects are very much longer than such effects such as fiscal policy or even monetary policy on, an, on the um, global economy. How long do you think the China-US um, trade war will affect the global economy? Mm. Great. Thanks very much. Angus, was it? Yes. Mm, for those questions. So yes, you're, you're, you're quite right. Um, and of course, in limited time, you can't put all the footnotes in the presentation. But um, you know, it's interesting to do that comparison, but it's a sort of a, an all other things equal comparison. And there's lots of other things going on. Um, the, the, long, the longer the, the Trump administra administration goes on, the, the more we sort of add quarters, then the longer you will go back in Obama time, and the longer you go back in Obama time, the closer you get to you know, 2008, 10 kind of recession period. And you're absolutely right. The, the, the economy that President Obama inherited, I mean, it was literally in free fall. Um, and the numbers were not out. It wasn't even like you knew it was in free fall. It was just, uh, it was literally in the middle of this absolute collapse in, in GDP. So you always have to take that into account in, in making those, those comparisons. It's, it's been less of a problem up until now because if, under this kind of comparison that I'm doing, you only go back to about mid-2014. But the further you go back, so I don't, some people, when they uh, do these comparisons, look at the whole two terms of the Obama administration. I think that just pollutes the data too much. Um, but no, you, you, you're right. Um, there are all sorts of things. I mean, it really points to another, another point, which is that um, in, in the US, and you're in these presidential campaigns, the, the sort of the, the discussion in the public domain is almost as if the president, whoever it's going to be, it has this enormous power to manage the economy. Where in actual fact, you know, they have a bully pulpit, they have some levers, they do have some trade levers, um, but they don't control fiscal policy, they don't control monetary policy, they don't really control. But you know, presidents tend to campaign as if they can manage the economy. They tend to take credit for it when it's doing well, and, you know, perhaps not so much in the other direction. Um, but um, you know, again, I wouldn't want to read too much into that that analysis, but um, you know, I think it, it tells you a certain amount. In terms of the trade war, um, the effects of the trade war, I, again, you have to distinguish between the short-term effects and the long-term effects. In a nutshell, I think the short-term effects are really um, twofold, uh, or short to medium. In the very short term, it's mainly price effects that, you know, if these tariffs are being paid, the tariffs being levied on, you know, probably $500 billion of imports at the moment, something like of that order of magnitude of, you know, 10, 20, 25 percent, that is money coming out of someone's pocket. Um, typically, in the very short term, producers will eat that, the sellers, the, the exporters, but before too long, it'll start to, to uh, seep into the consumer prices as well. Now, if that starts to push up inflation, the Fed has to take action to offset that as well. So two things happen. You, know, you get policy offsets, but you also get exchange rate movements. So what you would expect, have expected, um, is with major tariffs being put in place, there would be upward appreciation of the dollar and the, cur and the currency that's being hit would depreciate. And that's exactly what's happened. So that's another short run effect. So again, you get asset prices, you get prices changing. The, long the, the other short term effect is the uncertainty shock to business. So the problem with this whole tariff war is that the, the tariffs are being put on as a sort of a, to, to get leverage, as a kind of a threat. But you know, the expectation is, you know, then there'll be a deal that's cut and then presumably the tariffs come off. So if you're a business, you're sitting there trying to say, I, you know, I really need to be thinking about investing. Am I going to invest in the US, in Mexico, in China? Mm -hmm. You really want to know what the tariff structure is 
So that's, I think, probably the biggest negative short-term impact of this tariff war, is creating business uncertainty for investment. But the very long term, let's say that you did have these tariffs put in place, and you had a new trade structure, then everybody would adjust to that. And the long-run effect would rather be more in terms of the lost benefits, the benefits that you would forego in terms of the greater efficiency, you know, what economists call the gains from trade. Um, so that if you like, the longer term costs are more welfare costs, which opportunity costs, which you don't really observe. It just means that you're probably not in as quite a prosperous situation. But, you know, that's an economist speaking, you know, probably if President Trump was here, he'd say, yeah, but that's all very well for the people who are the winners from, from globalization. But you elites, economists, have forgotten about the losers and the people who are left behind. And again, that's a theme that you hear in the US political realm and also very much in the Brexit debate of the, the people who have sort of been left behind from globalization and maybe technological advances are kind of making their voice felt through the political system. Okay. Um. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. My name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member. I'm also 81 years old, and I have a um, I'd like to refer to your to the aging problem uh, in Japan. Um, aging actually is um, breaking the uh, the, uh, the the pace of the shrinking of the population as a whole. And but too many people are putting their head into the sand, um, talking about aging. The problem is not aging. The problem is shrinking of the population. And the um, well the main uh, reason for that is that 40% of the Japanese uh, population does exactly what you just mentioned about uh, the United States. They are being left behind. They don't have the money, first of all, to get married, secondly, not to have children, etc., etc. So what, uh, and the, the <clears throat> immigration, of course, is the other part. Uh, of the of a possible solution, uh, but we are g getting into this into the situation where the population in Japan will decrease by one million people per year, mm. uh, and we are having now a, a project going on for seventy thousand people uh, to be immigrated over the next five years. Uh, that's the new uh, Abe uh, policy now. Um, for us living here in Japan, Japan is a wonderful country, and I would never leave here. I have been living here for sorry. Could you frame the question if you don't yeah. mind? So the question is, uh, what ca what can really be done uh, to, um, to 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 put well Japan back on the on on growth? Um, uh, n not in a hopeful sense, but in a realistic sense. Mm. And so, thank you so yeah, much no, for uh, talking well, Thank about you for that. making that, that observation that, um, you know, aging actually is, is, is good for the population because obviously people are not, not dying, they're living much longer. The, the problem the driving the uh, shrinking population is, of course, the low birth rate, fertility rate, which in Japan, I think, got down at one point to about 1.25, so replacement rates about... 1.43. So, so, but the low point was about 2005, I think it was. It was about 1.25. Now it's back to 1.43. So it's on a bit of a rising trend. Um, but you know, to get to get replacement level, it needs to get up to 2.1, which would require a lot of. You know, a, it's a slow process. B, you know, it requires a lot of heavy lifting to get there. Um, and then there's a question of. You know, to, to what extent do you want there to be a kind of social engineering aspect of, of this? I mean, should the government, on behalf of society, be targeting a return of the fertility rate? I mean, there's they're, they're sort of political questions that, that uh, perhaps above my pay grade. But um, in terms of what can, you, what can you do about it? Obviously, when a shrinking population, um, you know, in per capita terms, it doesn't affect the situation anywhere near as much as overall 
you know, growth terms. Mm. But it does mean, you know, again, I, there's a geopolitical angle that Japan if, you know, is not in the most friendly uh, geopolitical neighborhood in the world. Um, it, you know, that may be partly endogenous, but you know, be that as it may. And, and so does, you know, from, from a sort of a, a national security geopolitical point of view, you know, with a big rival, China, 1.2, 1.3 billion people. Itself, that population will start to shrink at some point, but it's a very large population. On its doorstep, and also problems in the Korean Peninsula, does Japan just want to sit there blithely and let its population shrink at a pretty rapid rate? Probably not, from that perspective as well. You did mention, um, Conceba, um, immigration, and I think immigration you know, has to be a big part of a solution. Again, not for me to tell the Japanese what to do, but assuming there was a policy of trying to arrest the decline in population, which there is, um, you know, there have to be a couple of points. One of it obviously has to be uh, empowering women and you creating a situation where women can work, participate in the workforce and also have children. So that goes into all the childcare issues, etc. That's pretty, you know, I think the solution there is pretty kind of easy to identify. But how do you do that? I don't think realistically you can create a situation where Japanese women can go into the workforce, have pursue careers, and have children. I'm not saying everyone, but you know, people who want to do that. At the same time, how do you care for parents and grandparents who are aging, etc., without embracing uh, the immigrant uh, pool. So now that is actually happening. And uh, you know, I've been talking about this literally for decades. And my prediction 20 or 30 years ago was, as Japan hits this, this, this tight up, this, this aging constraint, it will start to embrace immigration. Um, it's just total logic. And you only have to walk around Tokyo and you'll see immigrants working here all over the place. And it makes sense. Um, if you look at where Japan is drawing its immigrant populations from at the moment, I don't know exactly the top, you know, China is one of them, but you have countries like Vietnam, uh, Philippines, uh, Cambodia, Laos, etc. And many of those Southeast Asian countries, if you look at their combined populations, take two or three or, three or four of them, you get above Japan's population very quickly. Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, etc. And they have younger populations. They have an Asian cultural heritage and they love Japan, they learn the language quickly and they assimilate quite well. So my, what I've been saying on this issue for a number of years is, you know, not talking about opening the floodgates and suddenly all these foreigners pour in who know nothing about Japan and they use soap in the bath and wear their shoes in the, in the house, etc. No, you manage the process in a clever way, matching the needs of the society. And you have good assimilation into the society. And I always make the point, I lived in Japan 17 years, my observation was foreigners who live in Japan, they become more Japanese-like. <laughs> Anthony's been here how many years? decades. Uh, foreigners who come to this country and live in this country, it's revealed preference. They are attracted to Japan. They love the culture, the way the co this country works. And they don't typically disrupt the country. They assimilate into it. So I'm actually much more bullish on Japanese society over time to deal with the aging process, again, through a clever, tailored assimilation of immigrant immigrants uh, into into Japan. But the idea that you invite people to the country, you take their blood, sweat and tears for 10 years as construction workers or nurses or something, and then you turn, say, OK, now your time to go home. That's not going to work. There has to be a, a much more path to citizenship, uh, a, a kind of a, an, a, a way that assimilates people over the longer term. Very interesting point. Yes, yeah, does it, please. Wait for the microphone. Oh, you have the microphone. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm John Arman from the Canadian Embassy. Thanks for the terrific uh, presentation. I have two questions. First of all, I mean, we hear a lot about uh, technology changes and the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I'm curious, and sort of when you refer to the numbers in the states, uh, whether you're seeing sort of any evidence or find any evidence of a ra rapid uh, change in technology that's impacting some of these macro trends, or in Europe for that matter. Um, and just secondly, in terms of your sort of scenario with the Bank of Japan and uh, JGBs, I mean, we hear about the 
challenges of uh, banks here in sort of making uh, profits from traditional uh, lending operations. How do you view that over the long term uh, when you look at those kind of scenarios in terms of the health of the domestic financial system? Mm. Thank right. Um, thank you very much for those uh, those questions. Which embassy was it? You said Canada. Canada. Okay. Great. Um, just so on the first one, the first one, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, which is this, you know, Klaus Schwab World Economic Forum kind of, I think, coined that term of all of these sort of new technologies, AI, machine learning, um, uh, kind of, you know, medical technologies, you know, all coming together and sort of fusing and, and creating a, a new wave of innovation and upending society. Um, what is, is interesting from an, an, a narrow economist point of view is a kind of disconnect. Because what economists worry about and talk about is the low productivity growth. And you know this seems to be in the numbers that productivity growth has slowed in the US and all of the developed world. And it's productivity growth or productivity or growth productivity growth over the longer term that drives rising living standards. And so there's a kind of a puzzle. It's a productivity puzzle. I and mean, Robert Solow, Nobel Prize winner, made a comment in the 1987 New York uh, Review of Books to the effect, much cited, that you can see the computer revolution everywhere but in the productivity statistics. And you can sort of make the same comment today. You can see the fourth industrial revolution, the, in, the digital revolution, everywhere except in the productivity statistics and the GDP statistics. Um, that, so there's a big puzzle about that. There's a big debate about that. There's a debate about is there measurement error, um, which you know, to a certain extent it, it may be true because it's very difficult to incorporate new goods and services, particularly digital goods and services and new business models and products in this single statistic of GDP. Right. I mean, think about GDP for a moment. You, you take the whole economy and you crunch it into one number. How do you do that? Well, there's a lot of devil in the detail. And there seems to be certainly a lot of this innovation, fourth industrial revolution, digitalization is, is not being captured. One of the reasons it may not be being captured, by the way, is that G productivity is measured relative to GDP. And GDP is measured at market prices, and it ignores what economists call consumer surplus. Consumer surplus is what you would, so the actual benefit that an individual gets from having access to these goods and services. In other words, you may be prepared to pay a lot more for something than you have to pay because the market price is very low. You know, water is like that. Everybody needs water, but we don't pay much for it, but we value it a lot. So there's, there's that measurement error issue. I think there's another thing that's going on, which is that um, you can have all the digitalization and social media and everything else in the world, but we have a kind of fixed proportions technology, which is our brain. And we only have so many waking hours in a day. And we only have so many, you know, brain only does one thing at a time. And if you're checking your email and your social media and your Instagram and everything else, or just the abundance of information that's available now, that you can just, you know, you wonder about something and just Wikipedia or Google it. So I think that we're living in this digital overload world where people's brains can only cope with so many things. And so a lot of the potential productivity improvements that, that would have been there, um, we're kind of consuming in a way through you know, our digital devices, et cetera. But there is, a, there is a real puzzle here. I travel on the New York subway, um, not every day, but frequently. And it's full of ads, just like, uh, like the Tokyo subway. Never ceases to amaze me looking at the advertisements. Other than social public service advertisements, you know, New York City, you know, public service announcements. Almost every ad in the New York subway is a new digital business model. Um, it's some company you've never heard of offering some service that you've never heard of. <laughs> and half the time you can't figure out what it's actually advertising. It's pretty obscure. Um, so we, 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 are, we seem to be living in this uh, period where one half of the economy is really being subject to this tremendous you know, Schumpterian creative destruction. But it's at the moment, it's sort of not really showing up in the statistics we look at. And you know, I mentioned that I was at the annual meetings. But I came away from those annual meetings feeling very much apropos of your question here, 
that the mood among economists was very sort of gloomy. You know, the, the other thing that economists worry about <clears throat> is, is what they call low R star or secular stagnation. Mm -hmm. That is the fact that the real interest rate now is much lower. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, central banks may not have much monetary policy ammunition. But this whole debate is cast and framed in, in a very negative way. You know, they call econom economics the dismal science. In the sense of, we have a problem and, you know, maybe we won't have any monetary policy ammunition or, you know, whatever. Um, you don't hear when you get a whole bunch of economists together, typically, the brighter side of the story of this scientific advances and innovation is seemingly going ahead in leaps and bounds. But it is very disruptive. One person's gain, you know, it can be someone else's loss until, you know, everything diffuses through the economy. Um, so quick answer is, I don't know. It's a puzzle. Scratching my head. Uh, the second question, very quickly, the challenge to the banking system. This is a, a big debate. Um, as you push monetary policy further and further, I mean, the ECB now has a deposit rate of you know, minus 50 basis points, the Bank of Japan minus 10 basis points. Um, and you know, the, the Fed, by the way, is undergoing a review, which is probably going to take a, about a year and a half. They're about maybe three quarters of the way through it of their monetary policy <coughs> strategy, tools, and communication framework. And it's a major review. And it's being motivated by concerns about, you know, will they have, how will they operate monetary policy in future downturns? Because in this cycle, they appear to be starting from an interest rate peak of 2.5%, where typically they needed 500 basis points. And, and so they're actually ha having this, this discussion sort of literally as we speak. Should they adopt, you know, if they need to, negative interest rates? Should they adopt some kind of yield curve control, taking another leaf out of the book of the Bank of Japan? Um, but one of the, the concerns is always, well, if you do all that stuff, what effect does it have on the banking system? Um, there is a debate that says maybe at some point monetary policy will actually become counterproductive because of the damage it potentially does to the banking system and your monetary transmission channel sort of breaks down. Um, that's still an open debate. Um, my own view on this is, but I mean, just to answer your question, the, in some sense, the the banking, from a macro perspective, the perspective we're talking about here, um, monetary policy doesn't exist for the banks. The banks exist for monetary policy. I'm stating it very, very crudely. But if you're Governor Kuroda, your job is to manage the macro economy, not to worry about the health, the profitability of the banking system per se. Per se is important qualifier. You worry about it in as much as you don't want to uh, do something that's counterproductive in terms of transmitting your monetary policy. But it may well be that in this world we're moving into in the future, with this you know, secular stagnation, this low, chronically low real rate of interest, that we end up with, you know, there will need to be adjustments in the banking system. And maybe Japan's model you know, has to evolve. Um, but my bigger point, just harking back to the very last point that I, uh, in my presentation, is in all of these monetary policy discussions that the Fed's now, the ECB is going to have their review now under Gov uh, President Lagarde, etc., is the focus is far too narrow. I believe that when you get to the zero bound and you're starting to think about do we do QE, negative interest rates, basically it's time to turn to fiscal policy to take up the main responsibility of macroeconomic, or at least a prime responsibility, and to act with the central bank. I think the framing of the whole issue is far too narrow, and I think the banking system, to, just to come back on your point, the banking system, I think, is going to be much healthier in a world at the zero bound where fiscal policy is acting very actively with monetary policy to stimulate the economy than rather this mindset that we have to have fiscal consolidation. Mm -hmm. And we have to therefore put more onus on monetary policy. And just to close out, uh, I'm on the public record uh, you know, for the last few years of vehemently opposing the consumption tax hikes in Japan. And what has happened under Abenomics 
and this was actually part of the plan, was the consumption tax has gone from 5% to 10% doubled. So that is a draining of consumer purchasing power from the economy all during a period where the government has been asking the Bank of Japan to do this tremendous QQE to try to keep mm. uh, get inflation to 2%. So I think that um, a much more balanced approach to monetary and fiscal policy is really what's required. And I think that will end up being better for the banking system as well. OK, well, I'm not suffering from digital overload, but I'm suffering from time pressures, unfortunately. <laughs> and as this is a breakfast meeting, people have got to get to their offices, I guess. So uh, just, I'm sorry to cut it off, just it's really warming up. But anyway, thank you very much indeed again for coming. Um, I'm sure we have a one-year honorary membership for you, um, which will be delivered to you, Julie. Thank you. And um, thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. Thank, thank you. you.